questions, you'll move around. Situations, situations where we're either looking at a world that's uh, completely planar and we're moving around in and looking at that from different different angles, or if we're restricting our movement and only rotating around the optical center uh, and looking then potentially at a very complex object, right? We could computer homography that would do the mapping between the the images. Now, um, one thing that we're going to need is a bit of robustness. We're going to need that. Um, in this week's uh, this week's work, especially in the uh, including the lab on Thursday, so it's the right opportunity to mention robust estimation. So um, this isn't the only way to do robust estimation. We we've mentioned uh, student t distribution as a way to be sort of robust to things. When you hear robust, you should be thinking of sort of the things in your toolbox, and t distribution is is one of them because of the long tails of your Gaussians. This is uh, let's say a much more visual uh, uh, situation where we could, uh, I think, illustrate it best in, in two dimensions. So um, it, for a moment, let's just think of data points, blue dots, living in a two-dimensional space, x and y. And you want to fit a straight line that goes through your points. Seems pretty straightforward. You just want to fit a line to the data you have. If you fit a line to all of the data you have on the screen here, uh, including these two dots up here, this is the line, this red line is what you'll get. And that's it. In, in, in essence, you're, you're done. And that's as good as it's going to get. Um, except that uh, if you know something about your situation, if you say, well, actually, uh, I don't trust all of my data. I don't think all of it is should be equally weighted and so maybe in all of these circles all these data points in 2d there are a few that are outliers uh, ones that if I fit my model including those points uh, my model will be misguided my linear model in this case a straight line uh, will be thrown off because because of in this case just a few outliers okay so uh, for these types of situations, uh, an algorithm called RANSAC, random sampling by consensus, uh, was invented. And consensus, you can already sort of interpret that word, we're going to be doing a kind of voting. Uh, we're going to look for the majority, see what the majority says, our parametric model, this is our parametric model, where our parametric model should be. Um, and that means that maybe the majority will win, the minority will, will lose. All right, so the procedure for RANSAC is pretty straightforward, so we, we'll, we'll illustrate this visually in a moment, but uh, overall the steps, we're going to randomly choose a minimal subset of the data. Now, a minimal subset of the data means the number of data points that you need in order to fit your parametric model. We have an abundance of data points on this screen, right? So is one data point enough? for our parametric model right now. Some head shaking yes, some head shaking no. Any more head shaking one way or the other? Is one data point enough? Our parametric model is in line. So you should be shaking your head no. Okay. Are two data points enough? Yes or no? No, yes. <laughs> okay, good. So we, we, in this case, our parametric model is happy with two data points. <coughs> so we're going to pick two data points. 
Uh, we're going to pick them randomly. Then we're going to use that subset to estimate our parametric model. So we fit the lines in those two data points. That would be easy. Right? And then we compute the number of inliers. So we check, basically, how many people are voting for that solution. How many of, of the data points are happy with, that with those estimated parameters. We're going to repeat that process over and over again, and we'll do a final re-estimation. So visually, uh, it looks like this. We have our data points scattered on the screen, in living in XY space. Uh, we pick two data points at random, put a line through them, right? So we've got our parameters now, and we're saying, how good are these parameters? And we, we put it to the vote, and we, these two points don't get to vote. Right. So you, you don't get to vote for yourself. So these two points don't get to vote. Um, who is an inliner here? Well, it just in this case, these three data points are inliners because they're close to the line. So at this point, you should be thinking, wait a minute, what do you mean close? Uh, and so indeed, for the ransack algorithm, you have to define this slightly arbitrary threshold. You have to say, I'm going to count points that are yay far away from my line as being voting for the line, and yay far away is too far away. They're not voting for this line. They are beyond the threshold. Okay? So you have some threshold. You say, uh, if you're close enough, you're voting for this set of parameters. And we write down, okay, three inliers for this solution. And we set that aside. We keep track that those were the parameters chosen when we picked those two data points. We set that aside, and we do this 500 more times, or 1,000 more times. Right? So the second time we do it, we're not gonna, we'll just do two. So we, we pick two data points, we fit a line through it, and we say, okay, how many inliers are there? In this case, there are eight inliers, eight points that were within that same predefined threshold around the line. And we say, okay, um, keep picking pairs of points. In this case, we pick these two data points. Uh, we end up with 12 inliers, and so on and so on. At some point, we might pick, you know, um, maybe even we'll pick both of those points. Uh, but then the number of votes for, those, for them will be very small. Let's say of the three solutions we have here, let's say uh, these are the, the you know, top three out of a, a thousand, uh, this one's got the most in mind. So this, we come back to this last step here, re-estimate the model using the inliners. In other words, this line was estimated using just two points, but we're now saying, well, everyone who voted for us, you get to you get to join the club, you get to have some say in what are the parameters for this overall line. So the line will just adjust a little bit as we now make a final step, use all the inliers to estimate the, the, param the, the parameters of the line. So we least squares fit of our line to all of these inlier data points, ignoring all the other data points. In this way, hopefully, ignoring the, the outliers. Okay? Is that really the easiest way of approaching that problem? You just take the median sort of the xy coordinate and put a line to that. Uh, so there are many variants on Ransack, um, and they are, uh, let's say, measured in, in a few ways. One of them is um, how scattered are the outliers. So if the outliers were, for example, um, quite uh, numerous, Right, then you start to, to worry about where does the median location kind of lie. Right? If you're measuring location in 2D, right, it might be that you end up with sort of a, uh, I mean, I can make sort of data points in an arc or something like that, and the, the, the outliers are in the middle, right, and then we start, we start having problems. But if you, it, it is perfectly sensible to say, oh, I actually have some prior, uh, and so, um, Args, argsac. There's a there's a there's a variant of ransac that will use um, that it allows you to incorporate parties indeed. Uh, the most typical one is ransac by like a, a, a hundred to one in terms of what people use, but <coughs> there are let's say good situations where you might use some other knowledge. Okay, so that's that's essentially it. Uh, of course, we've shown it for 2D. It could work for higher dimensions uh, as well. You just have to ask yourself a few of these questions. What's the minimal number of data points that I need to fit my parametric model? Right? Sometimes it's more than two. And you have to ask, okay, what's my epsilon for the threshold? How, 
my, my cutoff between inliers and outliers every time I do this this test. Um, is Ransack in this basic person choosing the points completely random, or we can say that we don't want points that are too close to each other? Because in noisy data, you if the points are close and there is a little noise, then it would result in like in the case B, it would be like shifted. Uh, yes. So th there is, uh, so I know a variant that does bias your selection of which points. So the answer is kind of similar. There, there's a, there is a version that does that, but typically uh, it's not needed because even if you took two points that were very similar, very close to each other, and just fit your model to that, well, it would be quite a, you know, let's say a model based on only a very small part of the data. It's very, very myopic uh, and ignoring everything else. Hey, if there are lots of inliers, lots of votes for that solution, then that's fine, right? It, it doesn't, it, in a way, you could say, well, I'm, I'm not going to look at the data at all. I'm just going to I'm going to blindly suggest parametric solutions uh, and see every time I make one, I see how many people voted for it, right? It's just easier when... You, you can start closer to the solution in, in, in the, right, so you might have reasons for, um, for starting with some points. So there are some, there are some approaches which say, oh, look for, um, look in a lower dimensional space. So if you have a uh, hundred dimensional model and you want to fit, you want to do ransack in a hundred dimensional model, maybe you'd have to choose a hundred data points each time randomly, right? So there are some approaches which say, okay, start with a lower dimensional search, right? Find a parametric fit for a lower dimensional problem, and then use that to bias your search at the higher dimensional problem. Yes? Do people only use this for these kind of problems where you have basically a line kind of data around the line? So kind of linear problems, or do people actually use it for nonlinear? They use it for very non for nonlinear problems as well. Anytime you can have a you have a parametric model. You, you should be able to, to use this. Uh, it's just a question of how many data points do you need. The minimal solution, right, uh, requires this many points. And OK, now you can fit your whatever it is, polynomial curve or, or something much more complicated. So why haven't we used it before? Well, it's pretty random. Uh, what would we have used it for? Uh, I mean, um, let's say I, I'm not going to. I'm not going to say there's nothing we couldn't have used it for before, but typically when we uh, when you have a closed form solution, you should use that, right? If you don't have a closed form solution, but you have uh, you can calculate second derivatives of uh, of a problem, then you can do an optimization which converges, right? If you have a convex problem, then you know you're converging to the right solution. Uh, this is, let's say, sort of a, a, I wouldn't say last resort, but maybe next to last resort, where you're saying, uh, I'm just going to see what the majority says, right? There's no, there's no guarantee on this. Right? We agree. There's no principal reason why this necessarily has to converge to a, a global um, optimum. If you got really unlucky with your sampling randomly, right, you could get the wrong answer. Or you could just have outliers that are pathologically organized, right? Uh, that they, they are very, very self-consistent. And maybe there are so many of them compared to your true solution, which is hiding there in, in, in the minority. So I, I wouldn't, I'm not trying to, to tell you this and then dissuade you from using it. I'm trying to say, well, you know, consider your options. OK. Uh, so if we fit a homography uh, to a pair of images like this happens to be a wall painted with graffiti. It may not be quite obvious. It's sort of like <coughs> the, uh, the bottom of the wall. You can see there's a, a camera shift kind of down to the left. Uh, we will detect interest points here, detect interest points here. Detection of interest points, uh, we did fly over kind of neglecting chapter 13, uh, unless you, 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 you did read it as, as I hope you would. Um, so detection of interest points frequently is called corner finding, although there are more interesting points other than just corners. But let's say we find interest points here, we find a list of interest points here, and then we say uh, which ones match which ones. And uh, here we might describe, so you understand the difference between detection and description, right? For, for each interest point, uh, you know, if that's an interest point, I can find it by saying, well, that looks like a corner. Uh, but then I need to describe it. And I want to describe it in a way 
that when I describe it and all of the other points here, um, and all of the points in this image, there's one description in this image that looks very similar to something I described here, right? And then I would say, ah, oh, look, uh, those descriptions are very similar to each other, despite the change maybe in, in camera angle. So detection, not to be confused with description. And if you're, if you're with me so far, right, this is where it, it gets really confusing because there happens to be an algorithm called SIFT for detection, and there's a, another algorithm, SIFT, for description. They're called SIFT because it was, it was sort of introduced at the same time, but SIFT detection is not the same as SIFT description. Obviously, they're doing two different things. All right, now, back to the task at hand. Detect and describe a bunch of points. Detect and describe a bunch of points. Do a process of matching the different descriptions, saying, all right, uh, for that point, wh whose description here matches the best? And sometimes you'll get it right, sometimes you'll get it wrong, because the descriptions might be uh, quite similar to each other. So you might get confused and map. Um, well, let's see, what's, what's something that's uh, good and similar here? You might map that point there to that point uh, there because we make our descriptors in such a way that they can cope with significant orientation changes, right? Um, so what you're seeing here is for every, for every point that we have detected and described, we're drawing an arrow to where its corresponding point is in this image. So that line there corresponds to that line there, and it's showing you that point corresponds to that point. And if it looks like a mess, uh, it should look like a mess. So we have here lots of um, lots of mismatches. So this isn't purely random matching C and D. C and D are uh, random match. They are uh, a search. They're a bipartite matching of all of the descriptions from image one. So we have. Uh, we have descriptor one, descriptor two, right? And this is image one. Sorry, I'm not drawing these very consistently. So these are all descriptors of the same length. Then we have the same thing for image two, right? In fact, a list of descriptors. And now we're saying, all right, you are most similar to this descriptor. You are most similar to this descriptor, right? And if this one thinks it's also similar to that, well, that can't happen. We can't have a mapping from one thing here to two things here. So there's going to be some sort of competition of which one is more similar. Uh, Do you mean the feature points of, of each image have descriptors describing them in the same way? That's yes. It. Yeah. So. so Sorry. So you're joining up feature points that are all from descriptors. We're joining up feature points, descriptors from this image, and the ones, the descriptors for image two. So th let's say the step I'm sort of skipping uh, is is drawing for you that I have detected here an interest point, which is described by the engine 28. Which is described by if it's SIF, it's 28. So there's another one that's you know. 640, there are descriptors that are much shorter, much longer. Um, and so I'll have D, D123, and here I'll have D5, uh, D6, D7, right? So I don't know that D3 is the same as D5, but I suspect it because when I look through the numbers here and I compare that to all of the numbers here, I see, well, D5 is the closest. And closest, remember, this is 128 dimensional space. You might be using like Euclidean distance or something like that to measure to measure the distance. That's what's done typically with uh, SIFT, for example. But there are other descriptors that we can use. Uh, you could use, if you've seen it in image, ma in image processing, template matching, and other things. Um, so it's another descriptor, right? And you're just using normalized cross-correlation as a distance measure say how, how close or far away are they. All right, so that's why, I, uh, let's say random is a bit strong, but independent. So uh, we've said D3 maps to D5 because that's the best one-to-one -one mapping I could come up with. And 
uh, that's what's plotted here, is we've come up with our best one-to-one -one mapping where we've ignored anything about this being a camera move, about this being a homography in particular. We've just said, oh, just match points. Uh, and that's great, because the, you, can do this, you can do this sort of thing for scenes that are moving, where lots of objects are changing, where the world is non-planar, and you're translating, and crazy stuff is happening. So I'm not saying, you know, never do this. You should do this. But if you do this, and then you try to, to use these paired points to compute a homography. Remember, we were computing homography, saying, well, where are the points in, X1, in image 1? Where are the points in image 2? Can I use those points to compute a homography? Well, if you use all of the points to compute a homography from here to here, you'll find that you'll get a terrible homography, one that doesn't, that, that sort of mis-explains all of the points pretty badly. So it, it, when you apply, let's say you compute the homography and you say, fine, where, you know, does that point really project to that location when I apply the homography? No, it'll kind of project sort of halfway in between. It, it, it will be off by quite a bit because there are false matches misleading you here in the middle throwing off your estimate of the homography. All right, so now we do ransack. Our model for ransack requires how many pairs of points? Two. So a pair, I mean an in, a point here and its corresponding point here. Four. Four. So we need uh, so maybe the question was asked in a tricky way. Uh, we need four pairs of points, so we need, uh, let's say, four sets. Is that, uh, is that maybe, maybe that's what you meant? Okay, so uh, if we have four things here and we know where they went, we can compute a homography. And everything else is gravy on top of that, but we just don't know which four. Aha! Ransack to the rescue, right? We pick four points, uh, not, not random four here and random four here, we pick random four and what we've determined to be their corresponding points here, computer homography, count the number of inliers, right, and write that down, and then repeat 500 times, and then we see which homography has the most inliers, re-estimate the homography, and then you have this solution. And what you should see in this solution is uh, that the lines are now much more consistent, right, so this should, should look like kind of this this transformation of our plane, right? You should see all the, the lines are kind of pointing in the same direction, not zigzagging all over the place saying, oh, I correspond to a point that's sort of down at the bottom. Um, what else do you notice? Compare the number of points. It's a, it's a, it's a real subset. We, we really drastically cut down. And so some of the different variants of ransack, they, they pride themselves, they, they brag about, you know, what percentage of outliers they can cope with. Because you, if you can cope with, you know, over 50% outliers, that's great. Isn't that cool, right? You got, you got a majority of points which are telling you gibberish, right? And you're, you saw past that, you ignored all that, and you estimated the right topography. Actually, it's not so crazy that there could be a majority of outliers and you still get the right answer because, hopefully, the outliers are kind of random. And so you, you fit a solution to some of the outliers and you get a random solution and not many votes for it. Right? And hopefully, in there, the only thing that's consensus, right, uh, that's, that's consistent here is, is going to be the, the, the true solution, the, the right homography. Okay, pressing on. Um, You've got a scene like this. It's not planar. And um, what's worse, the camera didn't just rotate. It translated. Uh, so now we're kind of in trouble, right? We know how to use homography. So we're not completely in trouble. And this is what we're going to do this week, is deal with situations where the number when points are all over the place. They're on, in, a, in a world with lots of depth variation. Uh, and, and we're going to sort of come back to, to that world. But last week, we introduced this simplified situation of homographies, right, of projective transform, because we wanted to, to say, look, it's more robust. We only need four, point, four pairs of points. Uh, and so this is uh, you know, potentially doable with homographies, but, but not really because of these, these problems I just mentioned. We've got different planes. Can we still use homographies? Can we do this maybe in a few steps? Can someone suggest what we should do here? I want to estimate the relationship between things in this scene and things in this scene. And I'm only good at doing planes. 
So what what can I do? We got to infer the number of planes first. Uh, we could let's say I will eventually infer the number of, of planes. Do I need to to do it first? Well, if you knew. Okay, let's say I know it. Let's say, that's fine. Uh, I don't mind. Uh, I'm going to say there are four planes. You want to see if there are four clusters in your sack. Interesting. Yes. I think this is quite quite reasonable. So we, we run Ransac, uh maybe not just 500 times, but a lot of times, and we look for what are the, the top four sort of votes. Uh, okay. Uh, this is quite quite reasonable, and, and I won't I won't drag it out anymore. Um, it's possible sometimes that the, like the first two clusters might have, uh, rather than being two separate solutions, they might be actually quite overlapping with each other, and, and, and so that's the only thing wrong with that suggestion. By the way, I think it's absolutely right, and and so just to deal with that, people have gone with the not so attractive uh, solution of doing it one at a time. So they'll, they'll do ransack, uh, and they'll find the, the largest number of votes, and say, OK, all those points that are in liars, we pull them out. And then we repeat ransack all over again, fresh. So let's say yours was more efficient, um, but it, it, it allowed maybe for the same solution to, be, to appear twice. Uh, here, they're doing the less efficient and actually quite brittle thing of saying, OK, well, we'll just, we'll just do it multiple times, and then and always extract those points so that they're not present the next in the next sort of round of ransack. Uh, interesting, maybe not surprising. The the dominant, the the first um, solution that's found with the most inliers is the one on the most textured part of the scene, right? So it just happens to be that that had lots of corners. It's not the sort of most planar or the or, or whatever. It's just the one that happened to have lots of texture. So depending on what shirt I'm wearing or what you know, uh, what color of brick you use, you could. You know, that'll, that'll be the first wall that gets explained. Uh, and then we do repeat, we find, uh, we do run ransack, find the next largest num cluster of inliers, remove those points, uh, next, remove those points, and then you're left with this sort of thing. And it, it's, it gets quite tricky because now you don't have many points left, or, or you know, you've much really depleted your points. Uh, and so you end up fitting a plane to these points, that point and that, those two points there included, right? Ransack said it was okay, these are inliers, everybody's happy, except us, because we're kind of looking at it saying, well, that doesn't, doesn't really, that's not actually a, a 3D plane in the world, right? I, uh, not, not a great solution, but that's it's actually quite a typical one. So this uh, Pro algorithm is very, uh, very new, so I guess it's about a year and a half old, um, from some of the same people who did alpha expansion. And that, now you'll see why that's not a surprise. Uh, they said, okay, look, you've got points, these, these points appearing in image one, we call them the X's, right? And we have points appearing in image two, that will be the Y's. And so we just, we have these points, which is this ransack we're doing is we're pairing, uh, picking which X, Y combinations. Um, and what they do is they say, all right, uh, let's make a Markov random field that looks at the locations of X's and the locations of Y's and says, I'm going to assign a label to you. This is much more in the spirit of what you're suggesting. I'm going to assign a label to you uh, that says whether you are part of plane, i.e. homography, number one, that's label one, or label two, label three, or label four. Now we're, we're saying, I know the number, I'm going to guess that I know the number of planes in advance, yes? And uh, we're going to have a Markov random field that assigns the, the labels in a way that keeps things smooth. The neighboring labels should be the same, and you pay a little penalty whenever you transition from one label to the next. And in this way, uh, with the, the Markov random field is going to do a kind of a smoothing, a regularization, and it's going to produce for us a solution like this. It's saying, look, I need solutions, uh, I need homographies where the point and its neighbors get the same signs to the same homography. We don't have that problem where points over here are getting mapped onto the same plane as points over here because in MRF space, right, they're very far away in, in the pixel space of, of um, rows and columns. And so this is quite nice. It also finds a slightly less obvious uh, plane here 
and this bulge here that this is actually sticking out a bit compared sort of this, this protrusion in the building compared to the to the main facade of that building and the roof as well very few points there but they are so far away from everything else that uh, it was just easier to assign them to their own label than to, to try to fit a homography um, where you know they were, they were basically counted as outliers all right so we've used ransack and we've dealt with homographies uh, and we're going to press on in a moment to go back to 3D and the world of multiple cameras. There's a question. Yeah, I mean, <coughs> so in this case you told it before. We, in this case we told it, uh, sorry, four is the wrong number. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, you could, you could try saying that there are more labels than you think there are planes. Um, and you're better off than if you underestimate it. But like, why wouldn't it say the ground is a plane? Because there weren't interest points there. And this is, that's, uh, that's a personal uh, pet peeve of mine, is that these techniques depend on your interest point detector. Remember how I was pointing out that, it, it, you know, it's all about the number of interest points that were found. That was why the greedy algorithm, the one that just went one ransack at a time, lashed onto this surface. See this? It's quite smooth. Most interest point detectors would say, uh, I don't see anything there. It is very disappointing and someone should, someone should fix that. Uh, but for, for this class, for now, we're only, uh, so I'm, I mean, I'm kind of joking, but not, right? It's, it's actually a problem and, and uh, you know, people are working on it. Uh, one, of, one of my students is working on it. Uh, so, uh, for the purposes of this class, we'll assume we have interest points. We can do this kind of matching. Sometimes it gets it right, sometimes it gets it wrong. We'll use Ransack when we need to uh, this week as well. Okay? Is Perl exhaustive in terms of are those all the interest points that we found on a picture? Because in terms of Ransack, we said that it say cuts off 50% of outliers, while here we have this plane on the roof which has uh, very little points that would, I think, if you just use Ransack, it, they would be treated as outliers. Yeah, so, I indeed, so there were some points that were up here on the roof that were uh, excluded now. So, so we, we, Ransack is not exhaustive. And L is like uh, sorry, and Perl, and neither is Perl. I'm sorry, that was a question, yes. Okay, so um, I think we kind of went through the applications, so let us jump now to your slides for chapter 16. Uh, and even though we're going to, to jump to the slides, I'm going to, let's see if I can show you a, no, not that video. Um, I'll show you this video. Oh, all right. This video. So, we're going to get into this situation now where we're saying, hmm, yes, it's good when you can have a, uh, a planar explanation for what's going on, so a homography. But we started chapter 14 off saying, all right, well, there's a pinhole camera model, points in the 3D world, project down, there's an intrinsic matrix, an extrinsic matrix, and Eventually, we would like to do inference. We'd like to estimate where are the points in the 3D world. I saw something in one camera. I saw a similar thing in the second camera. Uh, maybe even I saw a video, as we see here. And I'd like, now like to estimate where are all those points in 3D. So it, here you have an example, slightly dim on this projector. Here you have an example where um, a colleague of mine uh, drove around uh, and pointed the video camera at this scene. Uh, and he didn't drive in the way this virtual camera is flying, right? He, he just drove around at street level. And you're seeing here a texture mapped 3D reconstruction of, uh, of those facades. Right? From above, you can kind of see um, the point clouds. They are maybe tricky and messy in the places where there are trees. You might observe holes where there are reflections, where there, things are very shiny. 
And of course, where there were occlusions, you, you see nothing behind that, right? If there was an occlusion uh, you know, from street level where the camera was, then you don't know what's behind it. So, uh, this is a video that is now uh, three or four years, three and a half years old. Uh, and techniques have gotten a little bit better, uh, but not much better. So there will be a guest speaker coming in two weeks, and so I'll forward an announcement, who is one of the sort of the two people in the world uh, who has gotten sort of better results than this. Uh, but it's all, it's all quite new, fairly recent, and um, they still don't deal with the problems of the shiny surfaces as much, uh, and they certainly don't fill in the holes, the gaps in, in the back, and so on. Um, now, what's missing, right, we're, we're, we're here, we're, we're good at dealing with homographies now, uh, and we want to be able to do things like that. So uh, this, is, this is sort of to motivate chapter uh, 16. So we're going with multiple cameras. Um, we're given that uh, we have J images, and in the J Im each of the J images we have I points, X, so de detected interest points. Uh, and through descriptions, we've managed to, let's say, um, find correspondence. Frequently, we've found the correspondence. Uh, the problem is that if I just hand you a video like that, you don't know your intrinsic camera matrix. You don't know the extrinsic, the rotation and the translation. And the thing, so these are the things we would learn typically, right? Previously we were saying we'd use a calibration board and things like this. Uh, so if you can, do what we did in chapter 14, make your life simple. Uh, and if you were dealing with the planar world, make your life simple, do a homography. But if none of those conditions is met, then you're, you're sort of, you're stuck here. So we're going to do structure from motion. Uh, and to do your, ultimately you want to do this inference and find the world's coordinates. Where are things in 3D? So this looks like this massive optimization where we're saying, okay, uh, find the maximum likelihood world coordinates, extrinsics, and intrinsics by just searching in that high dimensional space, very, very difficult, um, to maximize the probability of our pinhole camera model, right? All of the interest points I in all of the images J given these parameters that you, you wish to estimate. And we're saying, okay, well, this is a pinhole camera model and we're using a, no, a Gaussian, right, a normal distribution for where those points are, are projecting in the image and hoping that, that they project very close to the mean, to, to where we're predicting using the, the pinhole camera model as the mean. All right, this optimization uh, looks incredibly difficult and we already know from, from chapter 14, it's not gonna be doable in closed form. Um, but again, hopefully we can get a pretty good initialization and then finish things off with a nonlinear uh, nonlinear optimization at the end. All right, so I think I, we've already just, just des uh, described situations like this. You've got interest points uh, in both images, you find descriptors, uh, you, let's say, know what you think are good matches, um, and let's for now, just assume that we know the intrinsic matrix. We'll come back to dealing with the situation where we don't know the intrinsic matrix, but let's just say for now we want the world coordinates, we want the extrinsic, um, and either we know this or we, we for now, just uh, factor it out, right? So we assume that it's a, um, we're in normalized coordinates, so focal length of one and so on. So let's just look at two cameras. Before we go worrying about a video running, running along and looking at buildings, Let's just look at the first two frames of that video. All right, so we've got camera one, we've got camera two. Camera one sees something. So we've already got a ray, because we're going from the optical center to that pixel, and we're saying there is something of interest on this ray. Do I know what depth it's at? No. Uh, maybe this is the, the depth W, maybe this is it. Uh, not sure. All of these, anywhere on this line is, is a viable option. But rather than give up, let's, let's just run with this, this uh, sort of lack of certainty and say, well, we do know that it's not sort of above or to the left. It's on this ray. So this whole ray, that green line, if you pretend that it was visible, 
you could imagine it projecting onto this camera too and forming this line here, which is called the epipolar line. So this is the epipolar line, the projection of the ray that goes through X1 onto camera 2. If that was the depth W along this ray, well then that would be the right place, right? The pixel descriptor at that location would match the pixel descriptor at that location. Assuming this was sort of a nice surface that's, uh, you know, kind of, kind of uh, Lambertian, right? Not too shiny. Right? If it's shiny, that's a problem. Because the more apart the cameras are, the more different the appearance of that, of that location will be. This is why people focus on corners. They hope that corners of, corners of objects will be quite, uh, quite unique. Interestingly, right, that's rounded, so it's actually quite easy for, uh, to get that confused. Anyway, whatever the W is, for different values of different depths of W, uh, we might find that the descriptor from X1 matches different versions of X2. The nice thing, though, again, let's look on the uh, let's be optimists to look on the positive side. We know that if we're looking for a, a match from X1 in image two, there's no point looking for it elsewhere except on this green line. It just can't be there. Right? <clears throat> now, this is if we know the relationship, the translation, and the rotation between the two cameras. Because then we can do this projection of the green line onto the epipolar line in camera two. So we, have, we, we inevitably will have this sort of chicken and egg problem, right? If we knew the transform, then we would know where things project and we would know where to search for them. Or if we knew what the, the, the result of the search was, we would be able to say, oh, look, uh, X2, that's the right X2, that matches X1, therefore this line has to go through this point. Maybe if I had a few more points, I could lock down what, is the, what are the extrinsic relationships between these two cameras. All right, so epipolar line is this projection of the invisible ray going, going out into the world from the other camera, okay? We're introducing some, some terminology. We've got those rays, one for X1. Maybe we had some more interest points that we detected. So X2 and X3 give us their own rays. And therefore, in this case, we also have three epipolar lines. Aha. Uh -huh. Now, remember, all this time we're going towards this, this goal of trying to localize a, a good initial starting point for what is the relationship the extrinsic relationship between these cameras. We don't, we don't know it. We, if we did know it, then we would be able to triangulate and estimate the depth of all the, the pool points out there. Right now, we're not even worrying about where they are. We just say, oh, I don't know. It's somewhere on that ray, somewhere on that ray, somewhere on that ray. Now, wherever it is, wherever these, these respective points are on their respective rays, um, the epipolar lines projected onto this camera, they actually cross each other. They intersect at a specific location. And that, the reason they do that, or, or the explanation, is, is visually, hopefully, uh, apparent here. Between the optical center of camera 2 and the optical center of camera 1, you can draw a straight line. I mean, you can always do that. There's two points, right? Two camera centers. You can draw a line between them. When the line intersects the image plane of camera 2, that is what's called the epipole. That is the projection, think of that as the projection of this camera center onto this image plane. It lands there. Similarly, we could take optical camera center two and project it onto this imaging plane. Now this imaging plane might go off, the plane goes into infinity, right? Here's the plane. The field of view of the camera, of course, may be finite. So it's just lucky that this optical center has projected onto a, a 2D location inside of the field of view, but it could easily project somewhere outside the field of view. Nonetheless, so we've, we've introduced that we have our points detected on an image, cause us to have rays going out into the world. The rays project onto epipolar lines, and then the epipolar lines all cross at 
single point called the epipole. All right, so here, because it's in image two, we're calling this E2 epipole two, right? And there's kind of the reciprocal relationship epipole one, the projection of this camera center in camera, in camera one. Are we okay so far? Epipolar lines and epipoles, right? So sort of uh, new, new terminology. I mentioned that the image plane is infinite, but you may still not get a projection. You may not get an epipole that you can see in your image. Uh, this is a special case where there's no way for you to see the epipole. Here are the two cameras are set up side by side, pointing out into the world, and uh, therefore, the, when you try to project this camera center onto this plane, uh, you can't, right? So it, it results in these epipolar lines that are completely parallel to each other. And so you're trying to see where they intersect, well, they don't intersect. So that's, that's, this is our special case of parallel cameras. Uh, also, not so unusual, uh, I did a project where we were doing 3D reconstruction with a camera in a car, and the car would drive forward. So if you had a frame, then you'd have the second frame, and the third frame always moving forward. Well, here, what happens if you've got a, a camera, and it detects some points, so now you have your rays, ray one, two, and three, going out into the world. The camera center from camera one projects into image two, and there it is, smack in the middle, is the epipole. So sometimes you don't get to see the epipole, sometimes it's, it's uh, painfully obvious. But it's the same setup, nonetheless, we will continue talking about epipolar lines and epipoles, uh, whether they are within the, sorry, within the image plane, invisible or not. All right? Um, we're going to do the essential matrix and we'll save the fundamental matrix for uh, Thursday. The, the essential matrix, uh, so we're going to have these funny names, right? There are two matrices, one's called the essential matrix and one's called the fundamental matrix. Uh, the names suggest they're quite important. Okay. Uh, so all, all that we've done visually now, we're just going to write it down and, and so that we have equations so that we can find our initial solution in a closed form. So uh, our cameras, we said we don't know where they are it, with respect to each other. Translation and rotation, we're not sure. All right, so let's just make life easier and call the first one, just align the world coordinates with that. We'll just say the first one's at the origin. All right, we're not losing any generality here. We'll just call the first camera sitting at the origin. And we'll say the second one is some omega and tau with respect to the first one. Okay? So. Uh, if I have a world coordinate in homogeneous, if I have a world point in homogeneous coordinates, right, I pre-multiply it by the extrinsic matrix, right, uh, looks like this, right, um, which I'm going to call identity. So the this is no transformation, no rotation, right, because I've I've defined it that way, um, and zero for the last column. So that way I've got a three by four times a four by one, right, produces a three by one. So everything checks out. And this is my homogeneous coordinate with some scale factor. So this first line, everyone okay? Right. Second line, same point in the world W multiplied by this extrinsic matrix, which is non-trivial this time. So it's really got an omega rotation and a tau translation. Uh, and it projects to homogeneous coordinate x2. This is the other camera, right? Also with its own scale factor. Nothing new so far, right? All right. So. Uh, if we rewrite this out the long way, you've already kind of seen this. Um, the point W, U, V, W, right? We, it had its own lambda because it was uh, its own homogeneous coordinate, but we've just combined lambda, lambdas into one, one scale factor. We know that we're going to sol solve this up to one scale factor uh, of, of uncertainty. All right. Uh, and the second camera, well, we've just gone through this, so we know that it's a, the same world point, whether it's homogeneous coordinates or Cartesian coordinates. Uh, we can write this out. There's a relationship between um, the world and x2 and between the world and x1. Now this is convenient because we're trying to find some, some equations to constrain the solution, right? So we've got here that w 
equals lambda 1 times homogeneous x1. So we can substitute this in for w, where w appears here, right? So we're going to replace this w with this first equation. All right. So we do the substitution, right? So um, we, we have this equation, but we replace w with omega x1. All right. So now we have an equation which has our unknowns omega and tau. And um, now if we want to solve for omega tau, we might be able to rearrange. So uh, it may not be obvious that the best way to rearrange it is to get omega and tau uh, to a place where we can solve them, is to take the cross product. But uh, in fact, it's going to be. So we're going to say, take the cross product with tau of both sides. So we're going to say tau cross this equals tau cross this. The nice thing about that is that tau cross tau is anything crossed with itself? Zero. Zero. Yes, exactly. So that's going to go away. So we're just going to have uh, tau cross this thing, except this is a scalar, so we pull that out, right? So we agree it doesn't doesn't matter if I put lambda one in front of the tau or lambda one in front of in front of this term. So the, the lambda one is just sitting there up front, tau cross this. So on the right side we're okay. On the left side, similarly, tau cross this, where well, the lambda two comes out in front, but it's tau cross x two. Okay. Now another simplifying step we can take is take the inner product of both sides with the x2. So we're going to say x2 transpose times tau cross omega x1. Um, when we took the inner product uh, of both sides with x2, right, the x2 on, um, on this side, because this was something cross x2, that means it's perpendicular to x2. If you take this dot product of something that's perpendicular, right, you end up with 0. So this left side becomes 0, and we just move the 0 over to the other side. Right, so you've got something cross x2 dotted with x2 gives you, gives you 0. So that's sort of the, the, the step that's happening here. So now we just have this, sorry, just have this one equation equal to 0, x2 transpose tau cross omega x1 equals 0. And this is uh, a beautiful thing because we have a relationship that just has tau and omega and it's relating x1 and x2 uh, and setting them equal to, to 0. This is a way of performing cross product is to take this, this cross product that's here explicit and rewrite this as a tau sub cross matrix. Ah, sorry. Just, just one second. All right. So we have tau cross x is this matrix. So if you replace this cross product with a multiplication by this matrix, which just has the tau elements tau z, tau x, tau y in it in special places, right? then you can rewrite that equation as this equation. We're calling E the product of tau sub cross times omega. So that times omega is this E matrix, the essential matrix. All right. So we've turned the cross product into this linear matrix multiplication. That in itself is a, is a pretty sort of standard linear algebra trick. And we've arrived at this solution where it says there is an essential matrix which just wraps up translation and rotation. That's all it is. We know, we know what it means. It means tau sub cross times omega. And this is a linear relationship we'll be able to, to use when we have suggested x1 corresponding to x2. All right. And now we really are out of time. So we'll stop there uh, and pick up with the tail end of essential matrix.